On today's episode of Maze and Blue Corner, we talk the Cole Bajima transfer, the Shea Patterson signing, and sit down with the Michigan Wave from Instagram. We also answer your voicemail questions, list our top three favorite artists, and as always, throw out some unpopular opinions. Enjoy the show. Yep. And we back. Of Maze and Blue Corner, unofficially sponsored by DoorDash. That is right, we're back with a whole new name, and hopefully, it's going to be our permanent name. We decided it was best to not have Ohio State in our podcast name for search purposes, and because, well, the whole just beat Ohio State thing has not worked out too well in the past. I'm your host, Max, aka Wolverine Corner. Joining me today, as always, is Ben Cooper and the UM versus Everyone Boys, Ryan and Jacob. I did want to mention really quickly before we get started, uh, please like this and subscribe. And if you're on Apple, leave us a five star rating. It helps us a ton. We're a new podcast, and the best way that you can help us is by subscribing and to just tell a family member or friend about us. And of course, if you do listen, send us a tweet and let us know. The last episode went a little bit too long, so we're going to try to cut the chit chat and get right into it. This week, we found out that Cole Badgema has entered the transfer portal and will not be on the Michigan Hoops team next season. I wanted to get everyone's reaction on that news. Ben, go ahead and start us off. Um, the first thing I thought of when I heard the news, um, I was I didn't really think about it, but I when I saw the news, I wasn't too surprised. I, I've heard a lot that he loved the University of Michigan, but after the decision by Nunez, I mean, I think it honestly was the best decision for him. Um, I could see him going back to Washington, maybe playing for the Washington Huskies near his hometown, but honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, wherever he goes, I wish him nothing the best moving forward, though. Yeah, so I kind of agree there where I thought it was a, like a little bit surprising, but as I, yeah, because m- mostly because I thought it was kind of surprising because this was only one year after he um, first um, joined this Michigan hoops team. And I thought that he kind of liked it with Juwan. So that's why I was a little bit surprised, but to be honest, moving back to Washington might be the best thing for him because even though I saw him as like a backup shooting guard, if he beat Adrian Nunez for um, the backup spot, I don't think he would have gotten very many minutes. So this is probably going to be the best thing for his career. And I think that he'll be a solid starter for a smaller school or if he wants to go to a place like Washington, I think that he'll be a decent backup for, school like that uh yeah it's just it like at first i was surprised like wow you only played one year and you're leaving already but like the more you think about it like with the way Jawan is aggressively recruiting these top prospects is that doesn't really look like he's gonna get all that much playing time as long as he is here so get out while you can that sort of thing so he can go out west play for some team there and get solid minutes so i'd Say it's the best thing for him, but my not, it's not really from the Michigan standpoint. It's not a terrible loss. I mean, he didn't play that much, but I mean, it's a loss nonetheless. Yeah, I'm. I was a little disappointed. Um, I was definitely surprised with with Michigan losing so much guard depth. Um, he definitely had a role on next year's team. What that role was was you know yet to be determined. But I was definitely surprised. Um, you know, the biggest loss is his shooting ability. Um, you, you know, we might not have seen a lot of it his freshman year, but we do know how good of a shooter he is and he could have been. So definitely a little bit disappointing, especially going into next season with uh, limited depth at the guard spot. But it's a good chance for Nunez to step up. It's a good chance for Zeb Jackson to get more minutes to start. Um, it definitely opens up the um, chance for those two guys to really shine next season. Um, so I think we can all agree that it was a little bit of a surprise, but... As far as how it will affect next year's team, probably won't have a you know a, a huge impact. Um, moving on here, that, I think that's enough on Badgema. Um, we're going to get into Shea Patterson. He officially did sign with the Chiefs. Um, I thought it was a. a I'm a little bit surprised. Um, we we heard about the off field stuff, and it took him forever to sign, and it was kind of to the point where. It, it, we were all wondering if it was ever going to happen. Um, so I, I am a little bit surprised that he did sign, um, but obviously extremely happy for him. Um, no, nope, I don't. I think a lot of people think Michigan fans hate Shea Patterson. Nobody hates Shea. Nobody wanted to see him do bad. Everyone wanted to see him get signed, 
and um, I'm glad to see him land at such a a good organization. And it's also going to be pretty funny because if he does make the team as even a practice squad player or <laughs> or a backup or whatever, if he does make the team, he's going to get a Super Bowl ring before Matthew Stafford, which is absolutely hilarious. Well, <laughs> well, I mean. It's not really his ring. I mean, yeah, if you're on the team at all, yeah, you do get a ring. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo has a couple rings, but he didn't do anything. But I, I was, I was just trying to throw. Some I, yeah, I just said, but what did Stafford do? But, <laughs> well, I mean, it's just an undrafted free agent signing. In all likelihood, he won't make the team. He might. I just as much as I might want to be a Debbie Downer here. He's probably just going to be practice squad type. When it, during his career, he might go play in Canada or something. But uh, I hope he proves me wrong. Nonetheless, he makes the roster, gradually finds a role somewhere in the NFL. That would be that would be I would be amazed. It would be great. I'm gonna take the little pessimist pessimist role here. I'm gonna be honest. He's not making the roster. The chances of him making the roster are about the same as Adrian Nunez yeah, averaging 25 points a game next season. Hey, I think I think I mean I I. I think he'll play professionally football or professional football somewhere. He's not playing in the NFL, and he's not going to make the team. And it's probably for the best for him. But I hope he proves me wrong. Obviously, they, they didn't think Tom Brady was going to make the roster as a six rounder. So I mean, know. he got he, no. he did get drafted. As, no, as but still, to, there was like I mean, only... it, I think well, that's different. But well, I will say this: if if he does end up in Canada in the CFL, at least he'll get universal health care up there. So I did want to mention Ooh. that. Um, oh, you're going to get people mad now. That's kind of the point, right? So yeah. uh, moving on from Shay, uh, we are going to get the interview um, in the front of this podcast. So we're going to get right into that. Um, our guest has almost 60,000 followers. He's probably all of your favorite Michigan account on Instagram. Let's get right into our interview with the Michigan Wave. It's B Coop alongside Ryan and Jacob, and today we are fortunate enough to be joined with the Michigan Wave, a.k.a. Cam, an avid Michigan fan who has the number one account for Michigan athletics and is nearing 60,000 followers. How's your, how's your quarantine going, Cam? Solid so far. Uh, I've been doing a lot of relaxing, trying to keep in shape, uh, playing a lot of Xbox, which is nice because I didn't always have that much time for it. Um, recently I just started working again, so I'm, I'm doing my deck staining job, which is my fourth summer doing this. So just started that basically a week or two ago. So, uh, I'm staying active, working outside by myself, making some cash. So, uh, life's back to being busy, basically. I know a lot of people know you from your account, but did you ever play sports in the past? And if so, what sports did you play? Yeah, actually I did. Um, I believe my first sport I played was soccer and I played hockey. I played high school football in 11th and 12th grade as a defensive back. Uh, unfortunately I broke my foot senior year. Um, so that really screwed my year up my season, but, uh, I also played baseball and baseball is probably my, my sport that I'm best at, to be honest. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, Cam, you know, you have your deck staining job, you know, it's great. You're making your money, but what would you say exactly, you know, a little bit down the road, what would you, what would you say is your dream job? My dream job would probably be to be a graphic designer or a social media manager, a specialist or a content creator, whatever you want to call it. Um, working in Ann Arbor for the program, whether it's football, basketball, maybe even something like baseball just involved with the university and, and being on campus and um, that or having the ability to do graphic design or social media from abroad. So like wherever uh, I can travel and just have my laptop and that's my form of work. So I could be anywhere in the country, anywhere in the, on the planet and be able to still work even on like something like a sandy beach. So that would really be awesome if one day I could do that. Uh, you're from Canada, right? Correct. So what do you, what is the reasoning for you becoming a Michigan fan? Well, um, I first started when I was at my friend's house and I think this was 2011 and the Michigan, Michigan state game was on and I was drawn to Michigan's 
iconic winged helmet as well as the the coveted maize and blue i love the, the color combo i've always loved colors growing up and um so i was drawn to that from the start and then my friend who ended up becoming a diehard spartan coincidentally enough um and i remember watching denard robinson and how electric he was and, and that's basically how my fandom started uh, when did you begin your Michigan Wave Instagram account? 2013. Uh, this and was this was like the, in my opinion, the prime time to start a serious fan page because at the time Instagram as a social media app was relatively new still. And if you look nowadays, there's a new Michigan fan page being created every day, like multiple per day, and uh, gets a little repetitive. Everyone's trying to, to copy the other, right? And um, like I said, I think I started at the perfect time. And the biggest key for me is that I stayed consistent with it and kept working hard. And I didn't take many breaks. You know, I didn't take months off. I didn't take games off. And I believe that's been uh, the best, the, the biggest reason to my current success. Has it always just been you running the account or did it start off with like a group or anything? No, man. It's always been me. That's dope. Um, if you could give any advice to aspiring content creators, what would you say? I would say to be consistent and to stand out in any form. How are you going to make yourself stand out from the others? Uh, how are you going to make your page be unique? And another thing is to engage with your followers, be active in your direct messages. Most people, when they, when they message a, an account of 60,000 followers they don't expect to reply back and i do respond to them and um i think those three things are, are vital to a page of success how many yeah. dms do you think you'd get a day <laughs> that's a good question i've uh i've gotten it before um i wish i i wish there was a way to tell I, that's a great question i i would be super interested myself i really don't know like it depends on the day it depends on what's going on in the day like i remember when uh, the whole thing with Jacob was going on, especially the day he was announcing my, my DMS were going insane. <laughs> I had so many requests and, um, yeah. Uh, but so there, there's a website I use called social blade and I can use that to get, uh, detailed insights on like follower growth or loss per day. And they show like in-depth charts and, and graphs and all that. Uh, check it out, guys. Social Blade, and you can log your brand or account uh, in with your your handle, your username, and it goes for Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all that type of stuff. And I find it so helpful for monitoring my progress. Um, but what it doesn't do is show me my uh, insights on like direct messages. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, one other quick question is like you know, you know, you say you joined in 2013. How long did would you say it took before it really started to take off or it was starting to grow real exponentially? That's uh, a great question. Um, I would definitely say the year 2016. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. uh, that was a really, really fun year for Harbaugh. That was his second year mm -hmm. as the head coach. And everyone knows, like, 2016 was personally my favorite year so far in my life, but not, not only including Michigan football. But, uh, yeah, there was a huge leap of growth from – 2013 14 15 on to 2016 and then from there on all right now well, you have one of the biggest accounts on michigan and any social platform so what would you say it's like to run one of these big instagram accounts you have to be passionate um you have to be a hard worker and you have to be dedicated and, and motivated and um you just you, you you really have to want it that's all i have to say and it can be definitely can be overwhelming at times, can be seemingly feel like a chore or a stress or a hassle or like a side gig, side job, part time job, full time job type of thing. Like there are many instances where I'm working my other job and I'm stressed out because I want to be I've set the bar for my page to be fast with breaking news, whether it's commitments or or stuff like that. So. It's it's always like a thought in the back of my mind or a stress, and uh, it can be overwhelming. But you just have to embrace the positives and negatives, the pros and cons, and enjoy it for what it is. 
Yeah, so yeah, lots of responsibility, obviously. Yes. Has your account uh, always been called the Michigan Wave, or did it start out something else? That's another good question. So it started off as Hail to Mich, short for Hail to Michigan. And um, one day I was fooling around with the usernames, and I, I changed, I slightly altered it, or I did something to it. I don't remember what I changed it to, but some user took the username Hail to Mich like right away within minutes, and I no longer could use it. So I got screwed. So I had to resort to having these two ugly underscores, one on each end, one before the H and one after the, uh, the H. And I didn't like that as much. But then when I joined Wave, the affiliate, we had to brand our accounts to Wave and uh, I became the Michigan Wave, which has become the most popular. I remember I had some followers that were against it and a lot of people don't like change. But uh, in the long run, I'm happy with it. And my backup account is Hail to Mish. It did have the underscores, but I recently actually contacted the, the user that had the username. And he actually got back to me eventually and was super nice about it and respected what I was doing. I'm so grateful for that guy. And he altered his username, so I was able to claim Hail to Mish back. So I'm super pumped about that. How did your affiliation with Wave, like, when did it happen and how did it really like, go down? I believe it was like August of 2017 and I, I was just checking my direct messages like I usually do every day and this account called Greatest Highlights which had like a million followers messaged me and was just like a like a chill conversation it was just like hey or hey what's up or hey man and I was like what what is this what does this page want like what the heck this is weird but it's a massive account so I definitely should answer this so I respond back and we go into further detail about what they're interested in, what they're looking for, the brand they're, they're trying to start up. And it would eventually become the Wave official page on Instagram if you look that up. And then we got into further discussion and I ended up uh, discussing payment and signing a contract with them and whatnot. So I joined their team. Um, I know you stated that like you chose Instagram because it was kind of new and it was it, it was 2013, so it was kind of um, popping at the time. But have you ever thought of expanding your platform outside of Instagram? Well, I'm on Twitter, uh, the same username, the Michigan Waves. So check that out if you guys want. I'm I don't tweet much. I'll, t I'll tell you that right off the bat. I do not tweet much. All I do is you know I stay up to date. I do a lot of retweeting. I, I like some tweets. Um, but I just get my news from there and, and, and my like stuff that I'll post on my uh, Instagram story and whatnot. Um, I've thought about a podcast. I, I really enjoy joining podcasts as guests. I've been on the prattle. I'm going to be on blue by 90 in a couple weeks. I, I'm on this one right now. Um, I could start my own. Like I, I have really good relationships with a lot of the players and a lot of them get back to me in the, in the messages. So it's something I've thought of. Uh, I'm also on Facebook as Hail to Michigan, but that's about it right now. I'm always down for expanding or coming up with new ideas, though. Yeah, so I completely get that. And um, so transitioning over to Michigan, over the last decade, I know that you talked about Denard Robinson a little bit, but over the last decade, who is your favorite Michigan athlete to watch and why? Oh, it's a tough call. I have about three players that come to mind for this question. Denard Robinson, Devin Bush. I think my answer would be Jabril Peppers. He was yeah. just so electric to watch. I, I still think to this day that he could be a lethal running back. Like, like he was a great returner on special teams, but man, was he dangerous with the ball in his hands. And um, I love the Viper position that we, we had him play for Don Brown. Uh, sent him on a lot of blitzes, had him in coverage. Surprising he only had one interception in his uh, collegiate career, but it came against the Buckeyes 2016 in the shoe. So that was always nice. But uh, yeah, my answer would be Jabril Peppers. All right. Uh, so, you know, Michigan football always has these big, important games. You know, you have the Ohio States, the Notre Dames, the Michigan States. Well, like other than that, what do you think is Michigan football's most important non-rivalry game it usually has? Minnesota Gophers, mm. Golden Gophers. Um, 
They play them in the 2020 season at TCF Bank Stadium. We haven't played there since 2015 on Halloween night. I just posted Ooh, a video about that, that game, game. That, that uh, thriller of an ending. I posted that today, so check that out. But, um, you know, we have Was- at Washington week one, so that's also a huge test. So those two games I'm going to have circled. Um, more importantly, I'm going to say the Minnesota game, though which I believe is on October 17th, 2020. I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen with this season uh, regarding, you know, COVID-19 and its effect on everything in sports, but uh, let's just hope we have it. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm assuming there won't be any crowds though, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, moving into basketball away from football, uh, obviously Michigan basketball in terms of recruiting, we've had some disappointments, a lot of transfers. But with the class that we do have, um, what player are you most looking forward to? Would have been Isaiah Todd, that's for sure. Um, I'm really close with Jace Howard and, and have been basically since his pops got hired last May. Um, I would say, though, Zeb Jackson is going to be great for us. But Whoa. Man, I'm excited for Hunter Dickinson, the seven <laughs> seven foot or seven two center, uh, replacing Teske. God bless Teske. Really respect him and his career and the hard work he put in. But uh, I'm excited to, to watch Hunter. I, I'm I'm wondering how many minutes he's going to get as a true freshman and uh, how big he's going to get under Cam Sanderson in Ann Arbor in the strength program. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I'm also very excited to watch Hunter. And so now transitioning to our podcast theme this week, who are your top three musical artists right now? Oh, it's a tough call, man. I listen to so many artists, different uh, genres. I listen to rap, R&B, pop. I really like alternative. I don't really mess with country music. Sorry, guys. (laughs) But um, (laughs) my top three, I'm thinking like rappers for this. I'm going to go with Drake. Toronto's my city. Drake is the GOAT. I'm going to go with J. Cole, and I'm going to go with Mm. Kendrick Lamar. And if you had to say number one, you'd say Drake, I assume, or? Yeah, he's got got hits, hit after hit, banger after banger. He doesn't (laughs) miss. That's that's very (laughs) accurate. Nothing but dubs. What do you think about his new tape that he just dropped? Love it. Love it. Been, Been listening to it like crazy. Uh, my, yeah. One of my favorite songs is uh, Desires with Future. There's a lot of good ones. Florida with Love. A um, lot of good ones. So, Yeah, the Drake and Future tandem is definitely one that is not to be messed with. They always come through. Yep. All right. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you for coming on, Cam. Um, obviously, if you guys are tuning into this, you probably already follow him on Instagram. But if not, uh, just look him up, The Michigan Wave, on Instagram, and you won't be disappointed if you follow him. Mm-hmm. Um, now moving yes, this, on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on, honestly. Um, now moving on, uh, back to the original scheduled program, to our next segment. Max, take us away. We really appreciate the Michigan Wave for dropping in and giving us his time. We would really love to have him back on sometime in the future. Now we're going to move on to my favorite segment, voicemail questions. Each week we tweet out a number where you can call and leave a voicemail asking us a question, and we will answer it on the podcast. So here is our first question. It's Sean McElhinney from Western PA. I'm back for part two, and I was wondering, who do you think the stat leaders for the 2020 Michigan football team will be? Thank you, Sean, for submitting that question. And Ryan, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so in the past, I've voiced my opinion that Joe Milton is going to win the starting quarterback job, which has been unpopular. And so, therefore, I believe that Joe Milton is going to lead the team in passing as the quarterback. Um, I also think that I think that this is a pretty even quarterback battle. So I think that Dylan McCaffrey, there's a great chance that he could be this person too. But it's just, in my opinion, that Joe Milton's going to lead the team in passing. Now, as to receiving, Ronnie Bell and Nico Collins both stood out last year. But I think that Nico Collins, as a big physical mismatch type of receiver, is going to 
lead the team in yards. He's a guy that you can just throw the ball somewhere in his direction, he, and you know that he's going to come down with the ball. Like He's got really steady hands, and he's got the size to be able to get over most cornerbacks in the Big Ten. So I'd see him with, with good quarterback play leading the team in yards pretty easily. Now, rushing is a little bit different. Last year, we saw Charbonnet, we saw Haskins, we shot, and this year, we're even going to see um, Chris Evans come back. And I think that Haskins is actually going to lead the team in yards because we saw him we saw him play a lot more at the end of last year. And he got put in at big at big moments like like the Wildcat in the, in the Ohio State game. And I think that we're going to see him lead this committee and lead the team and lead it in yards, to be honest. It's it's going to be really close, but I think that Haskins has the slight edge. Uh. I mean, yeah, uh, but I'm going to have to, with the QB battle that's going to be ensuing, I think Dylan McCaffrey is going to win the job. I know a lot of us want Joe Milton to win it, but Dylan has been the second string on the chart ever since, you know, Shea got here. So I think in all likelihood he will win the job. So he will, you know, he'll obviously then lead in passing yards. Rushing yards, I think it might be Chris Evans. It's it's a t- that one's the toughest call for me because you have three guys who could run the ball, who are good running backs. You have Chris Evans, Charbonnet, and Haskins. I'm excited to see how the running game is next year. Receiving yards, I would agree with the Nico Collins one. Ronnie Bell would be his main competition for that, but I mean you had DP, you had more. There were more receivers last year with DPJ and some others, but I, it's just. I want Tariq Black too, but I think well, Nico is just more physical. He's bigger. He's just a better receiver, in my opinion, and more focus will be on him in the offense. So that would be my take for that. All right. Uh, you guys kind of summarized uh, a lot of things in terms of the quarterback b- battle, so I'll try to keep it short there. I think Dylan McCaffrey is going to get the starting job, and obviously that, that will make him lead the team in passing yards. In terms of receiving yards, um, I think Ronnie Bell, if I'm being completely honest, I think Nico is a, a better player, but I think the opportunity will be there for Ronnie this season. And I think he's going to, I think it's gonna be close, but I think he'll lead the team in, uh, receiving yards in terms of rushing. Uh, I think a lot of people are trying to hype up Chris Evans. Um, I think I don't, I don't see that if he's going to have that many rushing yards, I think he's definitely going to be the passing back in my eyes. Um, he will definitely get, uh, like a lot of carries, but. I see. I think Charbonnet will lead the team this season. All right, good stuff, guys. I agree with most of everything that was said, except um, Joe Milton winning the quarterback job because that's not going to happen. Um, let's go or let's move on to our next question. Hey, my name is Brooks. Uh, I'm from Ohio, and I was just wondering if you all uh, follow the NFL at all, and if you do, how you felt about your team's draft. Thanks. Thank you so much for Brooks from Ohio for submitting that question. And Jacob, go ahead and start us off. All right. Uh, well, I'm a Lions fan. Uh, why did I choose that? Because I, I live in Michigan. I'm close to Detroit. So I am not used to being satisfied with something the Lions do. I am actually quite thrilled with how it went. Jeff Okuda was the obvious pick at number three. I mean, they could have traded down, but it's a little hard to trade down when no one offers offers a trade for that pick. But well Swift, that one's a bit eh, but like once you get like the later rounds they actually got they actually made picks that made sense. <laughs> I mean they were picking a lot of Buckeyes too. They have a lot of Ohio State players on there now. Uh, the Detroit Buckeyes or something. But it was a it was a really good draft and I'm excited to see how this class does. But you know, if as a Lions fan there will probably inevitably be be some star player that they passed on. So um, I am not a Lions fan. I am a Texans, Houston Texans fan. Uh, uh. And considering they've traded, away, Bill O'Brien's traded away about every single player <laughs> and draft pick. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not that disappointed with the draft considering we didn't have a first rounder. Um, I really like, I, don't, I, I didn't really like our second round pick, but I really like uh, Jonathan Gre- uh, Greenard. I think that's how you say his name. The linebacker out of Florida. I think he's got a bright future, but I don't know. So I'm actually going to agree with Jacob on this one. I'm also a fan of the Lions. And even though they made a few questionable decisions, I, I'm very satisfied with the draft. Like, 
Jeff Okuda was the person I wanted the entire time, despite the fact that he went to Ohio State. And he's, I believe he's a generational quarterback. He is just a talent that you could not pass up. Cornerback. And, and um, I think that um, Julian Okwara, Jonah Jackson, Quinto Cephas, and John Penasini are all A-plus picks in my book. They are amazing picks, and they fill mostly places of need. I am a little bit disappointed that, that the Lions waited until until the um, final round to pick a defensive tackle. But when they went there, they, they picked a good one. They picked John Penasini from Utah, who is who is like a rock inside their defense all last year. And even though they took two running backs, which I was a little bit confused about, I think that DeAndre Swift is, is going to be a good addition to the team, even though it, it might not be what I would have picked in that position. But I think that he's going to be a good addition to the team, and he can battle carry on Johnson for that starting role. Now, I was a little bit confused with the Jason Huntley pick in the fifth round. Um, I think that he's going to. I think that he's going to be a little bit more of a special teams type of guy, like maybe a punt returner, kick returner type of person. But he was a very elusive back last season. I'm pretty sure that he was up there in yards per carry. So I think that there is a possibility that he works his way into the depth chart. Um, for the Lions this year. So all in all, I think that this is a very good draft and I'm very happy with, with what the Lions did this year. Okay, so I'm a Browns fan, big Cleveland Browns fan. Yeah, so yeah. I, I can definitely relate to a lot of what Jacob said about, you know, the the pain of being a Lions fan and how, you know, I'm sure there would be some star that we, you know, missed on or whatever. I can definitely relate to all that. Um, this is the first year in a long time that I can say I was very, very pleased with the Browns draft. Um, they got their offensive tackle in the first round from Alabama. That was their biggest team need. Uh, their pass protection was was god-awful last year. It was, it was the biggest weakness on the team by far. So they got their left tackle, which was huge. They got that really good safety from LSU in round two. That was probably their second biggest team need was secondary and specifically the back end on the safety spot. Um, and then obviously we took DPJ in the sixth round, which was – Awesome. Um, I think he's going to play. I think he's going to have a role on the team next year as a rookie. Um, I wanted them to take the DPJ in the third round and then the fourth round and then the fifth round. And when he was finally there in the sixth round and they took him, I was I, I was so, so happy. I think that um, whatever kept DPJ from getting drafted all that time, um, I don't know what that was, but I think the Browns got an absolute steal right there. So overall, um, my biggest takeaway from that draft is the Browns are probably going to win the Super Bowl this year. So I think that's probably the biggest takeaway that I have. Um, would you guys agree with that? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Not in the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's move on to our third voicemail question here. Hello, this is Seth from Hotel, Michigan. And I was just wondering what you guys' favorite piece of Michigan merchandise was, like uh, shoes, uh a shirt or um, any other like sign things or something like that. Thanks. Bye. Thanks Seth for submitting that question. Uh, what is your favorite piece of Michigan merchandise or apparel? Ryan, go ahead and start us off. So mine is pretty simple and it's pretty new. I have a Michigan number four Jersey that I have. And it's one of my favorite um, pieces of Michigan apparel. And it's definitely my favorite right now. And so I'm going to wear it every game day for, for Michigan and, and even to school. So that's just something I'm looking forward to doing. It's, it's my favorite piece. Uh, all right. I got two, I guess. This would probably be my favorite. Uh, I have a signed mini helmet by both Jim Harbaugh and uh, former offensive coordinator Tim Drevno. So there's that. But I also have a Michigan hat that's signed by Derek Jeter because like, I was at like this Michigan tailgate party thing bef- on Har- when the Jordan – brand came along and just i mean i was at a dick sporting goods it's this is a good story and it was like i knew and i saw about the party being tonight i was like there's michigan football and basketball legends at the thing and i was like what base no not basketball baseball legends i was like baseball legends <laughs> so i went and he was there and i got a sign and i he signed my hat so that was pretty cool um, for me, I actually have two as well. Uh, I went to the 2018 Final Four, which uh, was really cool. And I got a t-shirt there. It's actually not like Michigan merchandise. It's just like a Final Four shirt that they sold. 
And but I've gotten it signed by a lot of the players on the roster, as many as I could. I've gotten Duncan, uh, Mar, Teske, Pool, and uh, Mo on it so far. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to get the other ones, but yeah, I really like that shirt. My second, I have a just a Wilson Evolution basketball that I got signed by uh, the whole 2013 Final Four team. Uh, besides Tim Hardaway Jr., I'm actually kind of pissed. Like, I went to a camp like uh, when I was really, really young. Or, I, don't know, I don't know how young, but yeah, everyone was there. Him, just didn't just. Uh, uh, I don't even remember why, but I don't have his signature, and I'm still kind of mad about it. So, Tim Hardaway, if you're listening, uh, please, please mail me something. I'm I'm sure Tim Hardaway Jr. is definitely listening to this. And thanks yeah, again yeah, for yeah. Seth for that question. Uh, moving on to our last voicemail question here. Hey, this is Rex from Southern Ohio, and I know in the podcast you guys have re- recently been talking about how Ohio State's going to smack us the next couple years in football. How do you see that rivalry translating to basketball? How do you think we're going to beat them twice next year? Do you think we'll, they'll beat us once? What do you guys think about that? Thank you, Bryson from um, Ohio, for that question. Um, first off, I just want to say Chris Holtman is a really good coach for Ohio State. Um, a lot of people don't realize that because he still really hasn't done a whole lot there. Um, but he had to, he kind of rebuilt the program and he's kind of doing it his way with his guys. So it's taking a little bit of time. Um, doesn't have a great 2020 class coming in next year, but he is bringing in Seth Towns. Um, you know, the, the transfer from Harvard, I believe he's a, he's a heck of a player. Um, that program just in general is on the, on the rise. And I think that even though I would say Michigan state is Michigan's biggest rivalry in basketball, um, I think Ohio State is I think we're going to get some more intense battles and we're going to we're going to kind of see some, you know, a good rivalry here in the next few years with Juwan and and Chris Holtman. Um, I think the goal next year should be you know, there's no reason Michigan shouldn't go two and zero against them. Uh, Michigan will have the better team. Michigan will have the more um, talented and the more experienced team as well. So um, it should be a good rivalry for the years to come. Um, as far as next year goes, Michigan should definitely have the advantage i would say uh yeah i can agree with them but you know we should never underestimate uh the hate ohio state has for us they beat us twice last year so it's just i mean it's gonna it's always i mean michigan state is still our biggest rival in basketball but it's ohio state it's gonna get heated so I think you'll be seeing a lot of back and forth games later in the future. Ohio State's on the rise. Michigan's rising a bit too. So I think you'll be seeing high level basketball and the games will be very entertaining. Yeah, exactly. I think that these games are not going to be blowouts for either side. I think that these are definitely going to be hard fought battles each game. But if we're talking about next year, I think that Caleb Weston leaving for the draft in a not great 2020 class, it's good, but it's not top tier. I think that Michigan is definitely going to take both these games next year. And if Jawan keeps recruiting like he's been recruiting this year, I do think that we're going to see Michigan having the edge in the series for years to come. Um, if we're being honest, I think I think Michigan's going to have definitely the edge, as you just said, Ryan, for years to come. But I think next season, I think we're going to split. Uh, I, I mean, we're going to definitely be the more talented team. We should win both, but I, I mean, it's Ohio State, and I just I just see them taking one. All right, that was our last voicemail question. Thank you to everyone who submitted. If you want to submit a question in the future, just keep an eye out for our tweet that has the number on or in it. Uh, Moving on to a new topic here, uh, but sticking with Michigan basketball. Uh, We wanted to talk about the stat leaders, the potential stat leaders for next year's team. Uh, To keep it short, we're just going to stick to points, rebounds, and assists. Obviously, we will go more in depth and in the next season, you know, as these podcasts continue to get put out. But for right now, just points, rebounds, assist. Ben, go ahead and start us off. All right. Start us off with points. Mr. I know you'll probably like this one, Max. Isaiah Livers. I think he's going to lead the team Mm -hmm. points. Um, In terms of assists, a lot of people are saying Mike Smith. That's probably going to be the fan favorite for you guys, I assume. But I think Eli Brooks, I mean, he only averaged two a game, but I mean, with Simpson last year, no one really, he was the second highest assist leader, if I'm not mistaken. And I think, I think he's going to have a a decent year. I don't think it's, I think him and Mike Smith will be close, but I think he'll have the edge. And rebounds, I think we're probably all in agreement. Uh, Hunter Dickinson, dude's taller than most trees in my neighborhood, and I think he'll get a lot of boards next season. 
Uh, yeah, I can agree with that. Livers is going to lead the – I mean, didn't he lead the team in points last year? So why wouldn't he be doing it again this year? I think Franz might take a step up. He'll average some more rebounds. Yeah, Hunter will do it. Davis will probably get some, not that many. But I think Livers could get some too. I mean, he's a power forward. So assists, Smith probably has the best passing ability on the team. He averaged five with not so great teammates. How many games did Columbia win last year? Not a lot. If Like, what was it? It's in, it single, digits. It's in it, single digits, I'm pretty sure. It, it wasn't so, great. And that's so he dished out five there. He'll be dishing out, and he has better teammates now. So he'll, he'll lead the team in assists, whether if he's off the bench or not, in my opinion. Yeah, so for points, I actually have Isaiah Livers as well. I think that he he's a great outside scorer who can also go inside. He can just play really good offense just all around. I think that he's going to pace Mike Smith and Franz Wagner. Um, also, he also has three years under his belt, including one under Juwan. So I think that this experience is definitely going to help him against tougher opponents. And for rebounds, I also think Hunter Dickinson will – We'll place the team in rebounds. He's seven foot two. He's a great rebounder for his position, and I don't think that anyone else in this team can really pace him. I, I don't think that anyone's going to catch up to him. And last assist, I definitely think that Mike Smith is going to lead this team in assists. So at Columbia, Mike Smith had a really big scoring role and still had four point five assists per game um, in his two healthy seasons. And I think that with better teammates and less of a role um, in the scoring of the ball, I think that he's going to be able to assist. Um, a bunch more teammates. I think that he's going to probably jack that up to about six assists. Definitely. Um, to start us off with points, I have never been more confident in an answer in my entire life. Franz Wagner will lead the team in points next year. That is another Wolverine corner guarantee. As the second one on the pod. Um, Franz Wagner is, he will be the best true scorer on the team next year. He was the best true scorer for the last half of this season. Um, not only will he shoot a higher percentage from three next year, um, he continued to get so comfortable driving to the lane. He's a six foot nine wing. Um, nobody could stop him, uh, when he got to the basket. Um, I have him around right around that 17, 18 points per game mark next year. And I think he will considerably be the leader. Um, Isaiah livers, I think is going to be more of a, he's going to be kind of moving back to his, uh, more of a role player where I think he's, he's more comfortable. Uh, what Isaiah Livers does best is shoot threes. Um, Michigan needs him to be off the ball shooting threes next year. And I think that that's kind of what his role is going to be next year. Um, as far as rebounds goes, Hunter Dickinson. Um, yes, we had a seven foot center last year who seemed to not get very many rebounds when it mattered, but Hunter Dickinson's a different player. Um, John Teske was never a, a great rebounder at Michigan. Um, he, he's not, I, I want to call him a traditional center, but I don't really know what kind of center John Teske was. So Hunter Dickinson is definitely going to be your man in the middle. I think he'll be a much more natural rebounder than Teske. I think you'll see him right around eight, nine boards a game next year. Um, and assists, Mike Smith. Um, th- this is an easy one. He was, the fact that he averaged, you know, five assists last year for Columbia while still scoring 20 plus points per game while playing with shitty teammates. There's no reason to believe that he won't. And by the way, if anybody from Columbia is listening to this and I just called you a shitty teammate, I apologize that slipped. Um, I I don't think anybody's listening though. Um, But yeah, Mike Smith, he's, he he just did an interview recently. um, And he said the most underrated part of his game is just his ability to find teammates. Um, we got spoiled with Xavier Simpson a little bit just with how much of a natural passer he is. Um, Mike Smith might not be that good, but I definitely think he leads in assists. Anybody have any more comments on this? No, no, no. we're all good. No. All right. All right, sweet. So moving on here, we're going to get away from Michigan and sports in general for a second. Uh, Last week, we all listed our top three favorite TV shows, and it was a lot of fun. So this week, we wanted to bring you another top three list. It was everyone's top three favorite artists. We have not seen each other's lists, and we're just hoping that Ben's top three this week is a little bit better than his top Uh, three last week. (laughs) I mean, okay, Um, it was was a very elite top three, I'd say, but... Taylor Swift... All right, so uh, Ryan, go ahead and start us off with this one. What are your top three favorite artists? All right, so right now, my top three favorite artists are 
as follows. Travis Scott, Lil Uzi Vert, and Ariana Grande. And a few of these might may come as a surprise to you, but trust me, I listen to these people all the time. So Travis Scott is definitely one of my favorites, and I think that you all should listen to him too. Rodeo is as close to a perfect album as you can get. It is an amazing album, and I highly recommend it for everyone. I listen to it all the time. And Uzi is another great artist. All he, um, he puts out so many bangers, especially in Lil Uzi Vert versus The World One. Amazing mixtape, nine songs. It's a must listen. It's 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 not even that long of a tape. It's just really good. And Ariana Grande is one is one of the most un, underrated people that I listen to. I think that she has so many great songs, especially in her most recent "Thank You Next." But I think that all of her songs, just like in general, are just there's not really a mix. All of them are good. That's just my opinion. Did you just call Ariana Grande underrated? <laughs> In terms of what I listen to, yes. Okay, I was like, she's one of the most popular artists on the planet, but all right. Uh, I'll, all right, for me, top would be Lil Uzi, like he said. Uh, then probably Juice World. Then I'll have to go with Eminem. I'm from Michigan. I'm legally required to like Eminem, so that, that would be my top three. All right. For mine, I, I, I know we're supposed to do three, but I have an honorable mention. Chance the Rapper. Uh, he oh was my the God. first concert I went to. Uh, I don't. I don't like the back talk from there, but uh, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to be honest with you guys. Acid Rap, amazing. Newest album, pretty pretty fucking bad if we're being honest. So I couldn't put him on the list because of that. But I went to his concert in I think like 2015. He'd only put out put. He just put out Acid Rap. It was in downtown Detroit and it was it was really fun. So I had to put him on the list. Uh, Taylor Swift number three. I don't know who called it, but. Strictly Bangers. She's oh produced so many, so many good songs for so many years. So oh I had to put God. her on the list. Second, I actually yeah. got it right. <laughs> Second, okay. I, I gave you guys your time. Second for me, Black Bear. <laughs> Easily, so good. A bit underrated in my opinion. I mean, I know he's he's pretty highly rated, but I think he should be a little higher. And he also made a song with Cody Ko and TMG. So he's the goat. Uh, the la- my f- number one. Childish Gambino, Gambino, aka Donald Glover. If I could be one person in the world, some people say they'd be like LeBron James. Some people say they'd be Elon Musk. I would be that man, Donald Glover. Yeah, that's my list. I love it. Um, so Ooh. I think. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think I, uh, I think I might have misunderstood the question here. Um, so I'm going to go through my top three favorite artists. Um, number three, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, his, his, his <laughs> impressionist, his impressionist style of the mid 1800s. It was some of the most influential and revolutionary paintings of all time. Uh, his self portraits, paintings of flowers and nature. Uh, he really just has to be on the Mount Rushmore of artists, uh, in my opinion. Uh, he did tragically die at age 37 from suicide, uh, shot himself in the chest. Uh, there's a fun fact about Vincent Van Gogh. Kind of a depressing fun fact, but it is Not a fun, fun fact. Not fun at all, actually. I, I uh, so even though he died at 37 from suicide, uh, Mr. Van Gogh, your work will live on forever. Um, number two, Claude Monet. Um, I mean, come on. How can any of you guys leave Claude Claude Monet off off of your list? They don't call yeah. him the goat. They don't call him the goat of French impressionism impressionism for any or for nothing. I mean, Claude Monet changed the game in the 1800s and paved the way for so many great artists after him. So come on, Claude Monet, he belongs on the list. I'd have to say number one, Bob Ross. Um, his, uh, calm, yes. his calm voice and incredible passion for art makes him a no brainer to be number one on this list. Um, his paintings of nature are second to none and his incredible hair is a work of art itself. So Bob Ross, you are number one in this lit or on this list and you're number one in my heart so there is everyone's top three favorite artists um hope you guys like that segment and now we're gonna move on to unpopular opinions this is how we close every episode and i will start us off here um my unpopular opinion is when the season's over next year for michigan football when it's all said and done Nico Collins will not be known as Michigan's best receiver Mm. at the end of the season. And you're going to ask me, well, who is, I don't know. 
it's either going to be Ronnie Bell or Mike Sainter still. But my my unpopular opinion is Nico Collins will not be Michigan's best receiver. I don't think he will lead the team in yards next year. Um, and I'm not trying to call him overrated, so don't put words in my mouth. Um, I just think that I think the other guys are underrated. And I think Sainter still and Ronnie Bell are that good. If Ronnie Bell can lead the team in yards last year, why couldn't he lead the team in yards this year? So that is my unpopular opinion. Mine is, uh, it's not Michigan sports related, but it is uh, Detroit Lions related. And I'm not a fan of them, as I already said earlier. But if we're being honest, I tweeted this out this out earlier and I got a, a lot of hate. But I think the Lions will make the playoffs next season. Um, <laughs> they're definitely getting bounced in the first round. And uh, yeah, card. but... But, yeah, that's a B-Coop guarantee, the first one that has came out. And I think the Lions will be a po- uh, playoff team next season. All right, so my unpopular opinion is unlike the others. I think that Terrence Williams will be the sixth man later on in the basketball season next year. Oh, wow. So what I mean by sixth man is that I believe that he's going to be a solid 20 minutes per game, 8 to 10 points per game type of person coming off the bench for Juwan Howard. And I think that he has the skills to do this, and I think that he's he's going to set himself apart with the whole small forward, power forward jumble that we have in this roster. With his versatility and just pure offensive skill, I think that he's going to be able to set himself apart, and I think that he's going to be able to take that six-man spot and thrive in it. Okay. Now, my, my unpopular opinion is uh, going to be a few years down the road. The next Michigan quarterback that will defeat Ohio State – is going to be J.J. McCarthy. Uh, he is about pr- maybe the best quarterback prospect Michigan has ever had in like forever. He's going to be the quarterback that puts them over the top and winning the big games. I am so excited for him to be here and come here. He's going to change things. It's it's a he's he's going to be he's going to be a real good addition. And and JJ, if you're listening to this, um, I've I DM'd you on Twitter asking you to come on the pod. You've been requested by numerous numerous people so um yeah we'd love to do an interview with you um for sure anyone else have anything to add to unpopular opinions e cubes top threes are terrible well that's that's not unpopular that's that's a fact it is i uh i'm actually um i'm terrified for whatever next week's wait jacob three is did, didn't be. you have eminem on your list that's yeah all what's wrong with eminem that's all i'm gonna say you have eminem on your top three yeah, eminem is, is is great well, you have Taylor Swift. What? I don't... Yeah, name an name an artist that has lyrics like "Mom Spaghetti." <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think there's anything that bad. That, that it's 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 fire. It's just it's pure heat. I, I think that what he's trying to get at is that Eminem's lyrics are second to none. Exactly. Uh, no, no, God, no. With those unpopular opinions, episode three of Maze and Blue Corner comes to a close. Thanks so much to everyone who tuned in. Please make sure to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Shout out to DoorDash, Stofers, Lil Dicky, and most importantly, shout out to our editor, Quentin Cole. Per the Michigan Waves request, we are going to send you out with Desires by Drake and Future. Everyone continue to stay safe out there, and thanks again for tuning into this week's podcast. Go Blue.